Greetings. Welcome back to Hear Her Sports. This is Elizabeth Emery. In this episode, French-born Colette Lucas-Conwell shares her thoughts about independent French women being strong and willing to speak their minds. Colette is a U23 coxswain for the U.S. team. We also talked about rowing, of course, what it takes to be a good cox, if a cox is actually an athlete, swing, Title IX, and training for Tokyo 2020. She and I actually spoke twice, so stay with us while I wish her good luck for the rest of the summer. In our first conversation, she is in a period of big transition. Our second call is two months later, after many decisions were made. The episode starts, as usual, with Colette introducing herself. So here is Colette. Yeah, um, so Colette Lucas-Conwell. Um, I'm a coxswain. I was at UVA for four years. Um, I was a varsity athlete there. Um, we won four ACC championships, um, went to the NCAA championships every year, and we got third my sophomore year. Um, and I'm now in Princeton training with the U.S. women, and we're in selection phase right now. So from the 40-ish athletes that are here, 14 rowers and one coxswain will go to the under-23 World Rowing Championships in Bulgaria, which will be in about mid-July. Very good. What do you like about being an athlete? I love, especially with the sport of rowing, to be outside and with a team. That's the biggest thing for me. What's the thing that you struggle with most? Um, I think as a coxswain, especially on the U.S. team, I struggle most with the uh, the commitment I have to make that is not, it's not something that's typical uh, to regular people to have to commit this much time and effort and just emotion to a sport um, and just trying to be, you know, it's a very tough thing that we're trying to do here and just trying to stay positive through the entire process is probably one of the toughest things I have to do in the sport. And, and do you think that's in particular because you're a Cox? Yeah, I think so, because especially over the summers and with the U.S. team, the way it's organized, we sit in the coaches' launch a lot. So being a coxswain, we're not physically active all of the time. We're mostly you know, paying attention to what the rowers are doing, being kind of an assistant coach in a way. And it can be pretty tough being in that situation where you're being treated as an athlete, but you're not physically active all the time. And the coach expects you to also be on their side some of the time. And, you know, for example, like I haven't been in a boat in almost five days. I've been in the coach's launch and it's tough not being in the boat and doing what I love and being more of a observer than a participant. Um, And that's just the reality of it at this level because they spend so much time in smaller boats, the rowers do. So the coxswains just end up having to be an assistant coach like 80 percent of the time. Oh, I, I, I didn't know that. That's interesting. D- do you like that part of it? Yeah, I do. It's not the same as on the collegiate level. On the collegiate level, the focus is rowing the big boats, the Cox State. And so, you know, we're practicing every day in that during the year. But over the summers, I think it's tougher for me, especially. So, you know, this is my third summer doing this, and I feel like I should be used to it. But we talk with all the Cox and some are like, wow, we're going stir crazy. Like, we just want to be in the boat. Um <laughs> <laughs> we all relate in that aspect. Right. Uh, At least you have it, other it people to hang out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, we have a great time in the launch. Um, I do enjoy it, but it does get, you know, if I'm not in the boat for like two weeks, then I'm like, okay, coach, you, we need to take out the eight and I need to be in a boat because <laughs> I'm going crazy. <laughs> right. Let's backtrack just a little bit. What drew you to rowing or coxing and how did you get started? Yeah, so I was in eighth grade. We just moved to the United States from France, actually, when I was 10 years old. So I was still trying to figure out a sport that would work for me. I'm pretty small, so there's not a lot of sports for small people. I tried swimming. I was too small for it. I tried basketball. I was way too short for that. What else did I try? I was like four foot nine at the time. So finally, my older sister, she had started rowing uh, at the high school club, and she said, you know what? You're the perfect size for a coxswain. Um, now it's not super physical, but you're a really competitive person. You might like it. So I was like, you know what? Why not? Could be fun. And so I showed up one day at the boathouse. I think it was in October. Um, and they were like, yeah, you're the perfect size. Let's throw you in a boat and see what you can do. Which when you're in middle school, they just expect you to not run into anything and just follow the coach's orders. So did that pretty well. 
and I've loved the competitive aspect of the sport. So I just stuck it out for nine years. <laughs> I'm short too. And I always think like, damn, why wasn't I taller? Do you, I mean, do you yeah. have those thoughts? Oh, definitely. When I was <laughs> on the swim team, I was like, uh, if only I was like six inches taller, which is a lot to ask for. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I always wanted to be really competitive in swimming. I tried tennis. Wasn't really good at that. Like basketball, like would I've loved to have more height. Volleyball. Oh, my God. Volleyball was also a disaster. Like <laughs> I was just too short <laughs> for all of these sports. So it was frustrating. But I was so competitive. I just really wanted to do well in something. And in rowing, I could, like, that's my favorite part of the sport is that everyone is so hardworking and has the same, we're all incredibly competitive. And it's so much fun to be out in boats and just going after it every day. And that's really what's kept me in this for so long. It's just, you know, new challenges, you know, being on a collegiate team and then the U.S. team. It's just been really fun having these new things to learn. There's always more to learn about the sport. And just, yeah, I, it was perfect for me because I'm just the right height for it. Right, right. And so what what are the qualities that are important for coxing? And, and why do you think that you're good at those? So I think for a coxswain, definitely leadership, because you're acting as like a voice or a megaphone for the coach in a way. And the rowers need to be able to respect you and understand what you're saying to them. So definitely leadership. Uh, you need to have really good verbal communication skills because otherwise no one's – like the biggest thing about us is that we're communicating to the crew constantly. It's feedback. It's directions. We're running the practice. I mean there needs to be very clear communication. And then I'd say uh, – I'm trying to think. And we also just need to be competitive. That's <laughs> – you cannot be a complacent person in that seat. I mean, if you're right next to Australia and it is down to the wire and you're neck and neck, you need to be able to just get in the rowers minds and be like, look, we need to do this, this and this. And if we do that, we can get a gold medal and have that competitive aspect to you um, to be able to just walk on all the other crews around you. Um, I'd say those are probably the three biggest things, leadership, communication, and just competitive, like, gnarliness. And and during the summer, are you working on any of those in, in particular? I mean, is there anything that you're focusing on for this summer? Yeah, I think, so this is, so with my third time, I've gotten pretty good at a couple of those things. I think this summer, it's more about tailoring it to the group that we have here. So we don't have a lot of returners from the past two summers. It's a lot of new girls, younger girls who are really talented, but they just don't have the same experience that I do. So it's kind of tailoring what I say and how I say it to what's going to be most effective for them is what I'm working on right now. Yeah, you've been doing it for a long time. I would My guess is that you're, you've been coxing longer than most people have been involved with rowing. Is that true? Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, actually, funny enough, we did a exercise where we couldn't talk and we had to line up from least to most experience. And I think I was like second from the right like right towards the end. Right. <laughs> there was one rower who had the same amount of experience as me and that's everybody else was to the left of us. That's that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. My guess is that most people are not familiar with coxing and you know its role in the boat and why it's important. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um so the coxswain is the our number one job is the safety of the rowers and steering the boat so there's a little tiller underneath the eight and so we steer the boat we have to keep it straight during a race and essentially adjust to each of the rowers movements so that's number one job and then their safety it's more of just you know don't run into anything you're kind of the driver or the jockey in the boat and the rowers are facing backwards you know they're they don't see where they're going so we're the only one facing forward who can actually see what's going on so just making sure, you know, we're following the race patterns, we're staying out of the way of everybody else. That's the biggest thing for us. And then I think usually how I explain it to people is I'm the little one who yells at the rowers <laughs> and tells them what to do, essentially. So if the coach wants us to do a certain drill, we have to call it and tell them exactly how to do it at what time. Because the eight rowers have to move in sync at all times, and they can't really do it without a 
a call or someone saying, hey, we're going to do it on this stroke. So we step in and we're the ones who will say, okay, we're going to do it at this time and we're going to do it this way. And it just allows the rowers to just focus on pulling hard and the coach to focus on people, are the people moving together? What do I want to do next uh, in the workout? So we're kind of the mediator between the two. So that's essentially what the coxswain does. It's only in the eights, so the eight rowers in the one coxswain, so not in the quad or the straight four or the double. Those are all coxless boats. But since the women, the eight is the fastest and has the most people in it, you that I don't think I've ever seen a coxless eight. I don't think that would be possible. So that's why they really need us in there. So so all of the fours are now coxless? Yeah, they used to have them coxed, but I think they figured out a way to have them without a coxswain. There used to even be a coxed pair, so two rowers and a coxswain, but it's kind of, as it got more competitive in the sport and the level of speed and competition and fitness went up, they just realized, you know what, can we do this boat without a coxswain? Can they steer and be aware of their surroundings with that one? Okay, we're going to take them out of the boat. So now there's just a straight four. There's no longer, there's still a Cox Four event for the NCAA championships and the IRA championships, which is the men's collegiate version, but not at the elite and international level. I think it's interesting in the eight, you know, it's, it's probably one of the few sports where the athlete, all they are is a motor, you know, like they're not really thinking because they have, they have you to, to do that. <laughs> you can just focus on pulling really hard with the person in front of you. Exactly. We'll kind of take care of us. Yeah, exactly. So how do you how do you counter the argument that you're not really an athlete you're you know just sitting there yelling at, at everybody at the real athletes <laughs> Well the way I you know I agree with it in some ways cuz it's true during a race we're not really moving we're just steering the boat and yelling at them but we still have to stay fit so there is a weight it's a weight maximum but ideally you want to be right at the weight so for International crews, it's 121 pounds, men and women. And at the collegiate level, it's 110 pounds for women, 125 for men. So we do have to stay fit. We do have to watch, you know, what we're eating. I would say most coxswains aren't just naturally at that weight. They do have to stay fit. So we go on runs. We do low weight, high intensity weight workouts. So we do stay fit. It's not at the level of the rowers, but... There is still a physical aspect to it. And also to gain the respect of the rowers, you can't just be sitting eating potato chips while they're working out. Like you need to be participating too. So I'd say, I'd say 95% of the coxswains I know work out with the rowers on land when we're not in the boat. So it's still, it's still, we're still athletes. Yeah. I would also say that, you know, there's an athletic mindset that you talked about earlier is that you have to have that competitive, that competitive spirit. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the competitive spirit, and also just, it's a skill sport. So the longer you're a coxswain, the more experience you'll get, the more you'll know. It's kind of like, it's kind of like being a jockey. Like it, there is a skill to it. It's not just something you can just hop in and be a coxswain. Like there is something to it more than just sitting there. <laughs> There's the athletic mindset. Yeah. How much do you know about the motion of the rowing and have you rowed and how do you learn that? I know a lot. <laughs> After being in it for nine years, uh, it's, I'd say most coxswains have probably been in a boat. I've rowed, I rowed a little bit here and there. So when the rowers are in smaller boats, uh, sometimes I'll ask if I can go into a single and just, you know, feel out certain things like, oh, how does it feel on the foot stretchers? How does it feel on the blade when I do this? So I do know a lot about it. I think I know more about the rowing stroke from seeing it, a little less from feeling it because I don't get the opportunity to row a lot. The coaches prefer that we're in the launch with them. But it is, I think a lot of the rowing stroke and knowing about it is also seeing it from different viewpoints. So, you know, being at UVA, seeing that rowing stroke and then being on the U.S. team, seeing it there, maybe going to a men's practice and watching how they row, or coxing the master's team, which is, I think it's 27 and over. So I'd say usually it's about 40 to 50-year-olds rowing these boats, and they'll love to have a coxswain who's experienced come and cox them. So watching them row, seeing how they do it, and then just 
noticing the patterns helps a lot in figuring out the rowing stroke in general and what's most effective. How are you staying aware of each individual rower and being able to adjust adjust what each individual is doing and keep in mind the whole boat? That's always the balance <laughs> that we have to play with. We usually start out our practices in the eight with some rowing by pairs. So our stern pair, the next two people will row just on their own and we can kind of see what they're doing and you just kind of gradually add up from there. So then you row by fours and then you row six out of the eight rowers and then you row all eight. And by doing that, you can kind of see, okay, this is what each rower was doing and the little technical things they have to fix. And then when you pick it up all eight, there's, you want to spend, I'd say, most of the time talking about swinging together, powering through together, but once in a while also saying, you know, I can see this person doing this right now with their blade. That means that their body is moving a certain way. And then I'll usually tell that person, you know, hey, sit up a little more at the catch, get your blade in a little bit earlier. You can see those things just by looking at the blade. So there is a little bit of individual aspect to that and being able to balance the whole and the individual is really, it's something that we play with every single day, um, depending on what the focus of the workout is. You mentioned swing. Could you describe what that is? Yeah. So whew, swing, it's a big word. Uh, when we, I'd say the best example of swing is when you're in the middle of a race and you know, you're past the fast part, the start, which, you know, you're taking as many strokes per minute as you can and you've lengthened out a bit to something that's a little more sustainable. And swing is when all eight bodies are really moving together. And it's the last part of the stroke when you're just finishing out the acceleration of the blade through the water. And if you've really got it down, you can like really feel the boat underneath you moving. And it's just you know it when you feel it and it's going really well and the boat is moving really fast, you can feel that swing and all the rowers will usually be like, yeah, like this is it. <laughs> and that's usually when you're moving on all the other crews. So it's a good point in the race. Um, <laughs> but the swing is what you're really trying to attain <laughs> for the whole race. For as long as you can, you want to keep that synchronization and that swing and just really powerful send of the boat down the course. Do you know how to achieve that? I mean, do you have special methods to achieve that for you personally I mean for me personally there's a couple drills that we do that'll focus on that but it really comes down to just the eight rowers like rowing the exact same way I think it, they really have to understand okay how does the person in front of me move and how do I move it's kind of an awareness of oneself and of the people around you and if you are very aware of what you're doing and others and know how to as a rower, if you know how to adjust a bit to that, and I can kind of see it and kind of call people out on it, but it really comes down to the rower understanding that they need to make a change. And if they do, all eight body will be moving together. So I'll call out a couple people and say, hey, you need to swing a little faster or slower or sit up a bit more, but it does come down more to the rower. And there are a couple drills that we do to get it down, but it is it takes time, mostly. <laughs> it just takes a lot of time and a lot of being able to take feedback and make those changes to achieve the swing and that length in the middle of the race. One of the things that's unique about rowing is that you do have to do it exactly the same. I mean, and it, and it, and I think it's not really well understood that every portion of the stroke has to be the same because if one person is off, even just in a slight part of it, you know, like a minuscule, you know, five seconds of the stroke, it just messes up everything. Yeah, no, that's. I think it's one of the very few sports where you have to get eight and nine including the cocks and people on the exact same page because it will throw off the swing and the set and the juju in a way if you don't get it right in time is your sense of the water good uh pretty good it's gotten better i'd say throughout my collegiate career being coxswain we can tell okay we're going to get a gust of wind from port to starboard and knowing how the rowers have to adjust to it has been a huge advantage for me so we do have to be able to read the water it changes all the time so you can't be like oh the wind's going to be west six miles per hour today you have to be able to see the water see how it's affecting it and call it for the rowers if you want to make it most effective for them 
I want to get a little bit back to tactics. And you you mentioned being in the launch during this camp quite a bit. Are you are you part of creating tactics, or does the coach tell you you know what the tactics should be for a race, and then you just execute? It depends on the coach and it depends on the crew. For the last two summers, I worked with Wes Ng and how he did it is he's currently coaching the wimps pair, so he's not coaching me right now. But um, what we did is after the crew was selected and we'd had about a week of just practicing and drills under our belt, it was maybe like a week or two before we left for the world championships, but he essentially told me, I want you to come up with a race plan and then I want you to talk about it with the rowers and... From there, let's adjust, but I essentially have to come up with the first version, um, and we'll execute parts of it, little parts of it during practice, and if we don't like some of it, we'll adjust. Um, if the coach says, you know what, I think we can move that you know, 50 meters more, then we'll do it then. So it's, it's a bit more coach oxen related, and then the rowers at their input, but I do come up with the first version, usually, and it's... It's pretty much the same every year. <laughs> what are the val- variables of the race in terms of tactics? So in the 2000 meter race, there's the start, which is the first five strokes, where you take an abbreviated, uh, shorter stroke, essentially. And this is, I think this is universal. I'm pretty sure everyone does this, but you have the start five strokes. And then you take about high 10 to 20 strokes, depending on how long your crew can hold on to speed at a higher stroke rate, which is the number of strokes you take a minute. And then after that, you lengthen out to a base cadence. And that's, I think, the most crucial part of the race is really nailing. And that's when the swing comes in. It's really just nailing that cadence together. And depending on, you know, the last two years, we've had a move around a 1,000 meters in. So you kind of just keep your cadence. You stay in the race. I think the U.S. is known for just, you know, not getting frazzled by what's going on around them. They just kind of stay internal, hit that stride, hit that rhythm. And then halfway through the race or a little before or after it, making a move. So I think last year I called it as a USA leg bombs. And we just, I'll be quiet for about two or three strokes and just say, okay, leg bombs in two, one, two. And then I just yell out, USA leg bombs. And that's when we bring the cadence up a bit, bring the speed on a little more, and start walking through crews. It's been pretty effective (laughs) the last two summers. That's usually when we've walked away from Australia, England, whoever's in the lead, and we put ourselves into that first position. If it doesn't happen there, though, then we just keep putting the pressure on everybody else through that second half of the race. And I've never had it come down to the sprint, which is the last 30 strokes of the race, but if it does get to that we bring up the cadence even more, bring even more speed to the boat, and finish out the race. So there's really just three key points. It's the start of the race, cadence, middle of the race, make that move, go faster in the second half, and then finish off with 30 strokes as hard as you can. Uh, I remember last year we called the last 10 strokes of the race as blackout. Like you want to be, <laughs> you know, empty. <laughs> uh, it's, it was very effective. I will say that. I wouldn't call it for every race, but... <laughs> It, it's just like empty the tanks, leave it all on the water, no regrets after that last stroke. And they're usually wiped and like fall over at the end of the race. But it's effective. And it's worked the last two summers. We got two gold medals. So hopefully we can do that again this year, no matter who the coxswain is. It might not be me. It could be one of the other three outstanding coxswains we have here. But they'll probably follow the same general race plan and the same race tactics. Got it. What's the schedule for the rest of the camp? When are actual selections made and then what happens? So right now, they're focused more on selecting the rowers. So I think we still have uh, 16 rowers and we need to choose 14 of them. And then of those 14, which ones will go into the eight, the pair, the four, etc. So that will go until the end of this week. And then after that, they'll start selecting coxswains. So that'll be by July 5th. And then we have about two weeks, I'd say. July 13th is when we would leave for the World Championships, uh, which are in Plovdiv, Bulgaria this year. So get there July 14th because it usually takes a day and a half to travel and start racing July 19th. And the finals are July 23rd. 
So we do not have a lot of time left. <laughs> no, I'll say. How about that? Yeah. And yeah. so let's assume that you're going to make it and then you go and get your gold medal. And then what happens for you? Um, I'm debating currently whether I want to continue training full time with the men's team, actually, the men's senior Olympic team. They just passed a rule this year, the International Rowing Committee, that men or women can cox a men's or a women's eight. That's great. Yeah, no, it's really it's really good opportunity. So I kind of have to choose if that's the lifestyle I want to have for the next three years <laughs> leading up to 2020. Right. Um, but that's, yeah, it's, I'm struggling with that decision a bit because I also have a job that is starting in September in New York as a research analyst. So, you know, I could stay here, train full time, or I could start life as a you know career woman up in the city. And one's paid and the other one, I will be in debt <laughs> for another three years. Right. <laughs> so there, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of factors to consider. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, that's always a hard question, particularly for these sports that aren't making any money. No, yeah. Well, and it's also the way the donors put it is they say, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You have the rest of your life to start a career. You know, if I were to go to 2020, I would finish that out at the age of 25. I could still work. I could still have a life outside of rowing. But it's committing to the training center is a it's a full time, if not more job. Everything is put to the side. Family friends you know you can't really have you could maybe have a part-time job during that time but it's very tough rowing would have to come first and I just have to be honest with myself and figure out if that's something I really want to do for the next three years I think it is but I do have to see how this summer pans out and then go from there do you like training and competing I do I love it I've been doing it for such a long time though that I don't know I'm starting to feel a bit burnt out, but maybe it's just because I haven't been challenged as much lately. I've been in women's rowing for my entire career, so maybe being on a men's team would be that next step I'm looking for. But it is, I think I am feeling a little bit burnt out, so it's kind of like, okay, do I want to end my coxing career now, or do I feel like I've got something more to give to the sport, and can I take another step and try and make the 2020 Olympics. And that's just something I have to figure out while I'm here. Right, right. Well, very interesting. Um, so you're of an age, you're the daughter of sort of a pre-Title IX baby. Yeah. Were your, parent, were your parents really aware of Title IX? Was that part of your growing up and your sport life as a kid? Yes. Well, it's funny. So my mom played field hockey at the University of Wisconsin, which was not, you know, they had to pay their own dues. They were traveling on these pretty bad buses, staying in churches at night uh, for competitions, you know, anywhere for free. Um, so that was kind of her experience. And she always was telling me while when I was growing up, you know, sports are really important. I really encourage you to do them. And you've got an opportunity that I didn't have when I was playing sports. Why did she think that sports were so important? Like, what was it about her experience, particularly since it was as limited as it was, that she found it important? She, you know, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I think, and she, I would have to ask her this question, but for her, I think it gave her a lot of confidence and a lot of, you know, she's a, she's a really smart woman. She went to business school, was, you know, did all these amazing things and was a very independent person and my mom just really believes that you know with four daughters she really wanted us to not be someone who has to rely on someone else for a living she said you know I want you to be competitive I want you to be independent and I think sports can teach you those lessons the best um, out of anything so I grew up in France for 10 years where that wasn't as sports aren't as big but women are definitely more independent there and then coming here and having that almost flipped a bit where Sports are way more important, but I feel like women aren't as independent as they are in France. It's been an interesting thing to see culturally. 
Tell me more about that, the independent women in France. I, I, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, well, so I was only there until I was 10 years old, so I've only got limited experience. But I think every time I go back, it always is so interesting to me that I think women speak up a lot more. So even just sitting down for dinner with other members, it almost seems to me as if women in France are just not afraid to speak about what's on their mind. Maybe it's something about the culture or, you know, the way the society is structured, but they just aren't afraid to say whatever they, whatever's on their mind. If they want to try something, you know, their husbands are like, yeah, go for it. Like, do whatever you need to. And maybe that's just the women that have been around in my life uh, when I was in France. But, you know, they were always very highly educated, always had really interesting thoughts. Um I would say dominated the conversation at the table most of the time. And here I, I wouldn't say it's totally the opposite, but it's, I don't see women speaking up as much or I don't, I see men dominating a lot of social situations more so than in France where I'd say it's more 50, 50 and equal. Um, And I think that does play out in sports as well. So here you see men getting more opportunities for sports. It may not be as, you know, right in your face, but you can see it in the way we're treated at the university or, you know, how we're treated with job interviews even. Like it's so, it's subtle in a lot of ways, but it's there versus in France, there's a lot more equality in the way women and men are treated. It's still not completely equal, obviously, but it's it's a lot more so than in the U.S. I spent a year abroad in college in Italy and I always was struck mm-hmm. by, you know, it was supposed to be a really sexist country. And I was always really struck about how forceful and strong the women felt. But I never related it to what you're saying, which probably was it, is they were just more comfortable or more willing to speak out. And I really like how you talk about that. Yeah, no, I I think that's definitely something that's in a lot of European countries. They are just not afraid to. They're really strong and just really independent women. And I love that. And I see it more in the women in sports in the U.S., but maybe not in the general female population in the U.S. Right. Are you expecting that what you've learned in sports to translate to your executive job in New York if you decide to go that way or when you decide to go that way? I think so. (laughs) Um, I haven't had a lot of (laughs) I hope so. Uh, I haven't had a lot of internship opportunities because I've been rowing this whole time and so involved in the sport. But I think the commitment that I had is definitely going to play a big part in my job and just being really like when I'm in rowing, I'm a hundred percent focused on what's going on and, you know, getting the job done and all that. And I think that would play out in a career, you know, showing up to work, totally focused on what you're doing, not letting anything else distract me. And just that I want to, it's commitment. And it's also just, I don't know, just focus and drive and competitiveness would definitely play out in a career. And I hope it would play out well. And also just being a good teammate. So it's not just about making me better and making the other coxswains worse. Like, right. if I want to be the best coxswain, I have to work really well with the other ones too. It has to be a whole team effort. It can't just be me on my own. Right. The job that you've, you know, the little bit that I know about the job that you might be taking um, in September, it sounds like a very male-dominated job. Are you worried about that? Or do you have any tactics that you plan on using? I imagine you also being very willing to speak up. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, (laughs) I mean, in a respectful way, obviously. But if I see something that's not going well or going wrong, I wouldn't be afraid to go to my supervisor and saying, hey, look, you need to pay attention to this. I think the workplace, when I saw it, when I went out for my interview, was about there were a lot of women there, but it was still about 60-40, which is pretty good. But... I don't know. It'll be interesting because I've been surrounded by so many strong women for so long to be in a more male dominated environment. I mean, even UVA is a majority of the student population is women. I think it's like 55, 45 now, women to men. So it'll be interesting. (laughs) Well, and if I'm going to be on the men's senior Olympic team, then I definitely have to be comfortable being with men all the time and working (laughs) with them and being respectful and all that. And being able to talk up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with the men's team, that'll be, <laughs> they'll have to look to me like I'll be their leader in a way. So right. that'll, 
that would be an interesting challenge. It'd be kind of cool. Yeah. So what are your really long-term big dreams? I mean, big dream would be to win a gold medal at the Olympics. That's always been the dream and the goal. And I don't think I fully understood until now what that means in terms of commitment, but it is still the biggest dream. And I think also to be the first woman to cox a men's eight at the Olympics would be a huge, you know, that'd be a huge achievement and a big goal of mine for sure. It'd be amazing. Yeah, that that would just be amazing. That's one goal and long-term thing. Um, and I think more generally is just to spread awareness of rowing to other women. It's a growing sport and there's more high school girls joining it every year. But I think I really want to see even more girls join sports and be more independent and be self-confident because I think sports just have such a positive impact on girls. And so maybe this is something I do in my career or on my own time later on, but getting girls more involved in sports is like a long-term dream of mine. It would be awesome to see like a 50-50 equal Title IX representation in intercollegiate sports and at the Olympic level too. It'd be really cool to be a part of that change. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also like to see more, you know, young girls get involved in sports and really stay yeah. connected with sports through that difficult time where they tend to drop out. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I mean, I was lucky enough to have three sisters who were all, you know, they helped me get through that time through middle school and high school and had a really you know, independent, strong mom to help me get through sports. But I was lucky in that aspect. Not every girl is, you know, some of them are only brought up by one parent and just never get to see, you know, aren't or aren't pushed by their parents to go out and try sports. And it's, it's kind of sad because it's, it's so impactful in someone's life to be in a sport, no matter the sport. Yeah. Yeah, I think also we tend or a lot of people tend to have a very limited view of sports because of the media coverage. You know, it's like football, baseball and softball oh, yeah. and tennis. And so, you know, rowing isn't known and cycling isn't known. And then, sort of, you know, the non-competitive type sports like yoga and rock climbing and, you know, just adventuring are not known. And I think that limits the number of women that that or girls that can get involved because they just don't they don't see it. So they don't know it. Yeah, no, 100%. The number of girls I've spoken to who aren't in sports right now who told me, well, I just wasn't fit enough for soccer or volleyball. And I'm like, you know, there's like hundreds of other sports you can try out for where you could be good and that it's a match for you. Yeah, it's it's really sad. There's only a couple sports that they know of. And I'm like, there's so many other things you can be doing. It doesn't have to be super competitive 12-year-old girl soccer. Like, there's other things too. Right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking time away from camp and talking to me and being so intelligent and uh, well-spoken. Thank you. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you. And good luck this summer. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Well, as you heard, Colette had a lot of decisions to make as we left her. And because so much was up in the air two months ago when I spoke with her, I decided to follow up. She was generous enough to talk again just this week via Skype. Certainly my biggest question was what decisions she had made about her future. If you remember, she was, quote, struggling with the choice between a job in New York City as a research analyst and staying full time in the sport as a Cox for the men's Olympic team. Hi, Elizabeth. Can you Uh, hear me? I can. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. Well, you know, it's it's been two months, I realized, since we last talked and I was wondering what was happening and where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So... It's funny because things didn't go exactly according to what I had planned when we spoke last, which they never do, but it actually ended up opening a lot of doors for me. So I was not selected to the under 23 women's eight over the summer. I think the way the coach explained it to me was that the girls from that crew needed something a little bit different. So they ended up going with another coxswain, which It happens. Um, I wasn't too worried about that. And what that ended up doing is it allowed me to practice with the senior men's national team. Right there? Yeah. So right. Yeah. I took like a couple days off. I think this was around July 4th weekend. So I took that time. And then the coach said, you know, whenever you're ready, we'd love to have you and to come practice with us. So that next week I was able to start practicing with them. And I ended up being there for about seven weeks. 
Seven so, weeks. Yeah, seven weeks I spent with them. Just kind of, I didn't have any expectations because they were doing selection for the world, their world championships. But I was, you know, I wasn't expecting to make the men's aid. I was like, you know, this is my first time. The other two men's coxswains who were there, Lou Lombardi and Julian Bonanski, who ended up making the men's eight, have been here longer and they're older. So I just kind of was there to learn and see what it would be like to be on a men's team. And I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. The guys who were there were awesome and made the transition to a men's team very easy for me. And so I was there for seven weeks. And then I spoke with the coach who said, you know, you know, we're not going to select you for the men's eight this summer, but that doesn't mean anything about your chances for later on for 2020. And so what he ended up doing is extending an invitation for me to come train with them for the Olympics. And he did understand that I have a job in New York this year and an apartment and all that. He said, you know, take your time, take a couple years if you need to. Like, I know you've got your lease in New York, but as soon as you're ready, we'd love to have you come out and train for the Olympic boat. He said he wants two coxswains there, um, and he wants me to be one of them to try out for the boat. Wow, so, that's great. Yeah, so it was really cool. So I didn't end up, you know, one door closes, another one opens. Right. So, yeah, so this actually ended up being a really cool opportunity to be the first woman to even train full-time with the men's team. So that was a really cool experience, and I really enjoyed getting to know the guys. The last time we spoke, you seemed sort of hesitant about what was going on with your prospects on the women's team. And I was just wondering how hard it was to not make the team for you. And it sounds like you bounced right back, but I'm wondering if there was a, you know, a period after finding out that you didn't make the team that was really hard. Yeah, I think it was, there was a little bit of um, like that, that day was a bit weird for me because before I'd even thought about practicing with the men's team, not making the women's team not only meant, you know, I wouldn't be practicing anymore that summer, but it meant I was kind of done with my collegiate career. Since I've already graduated from college, you know, this kind of signaled like I'm done with rowing in a way. Right. Um, Which was, it was really weird for me to uh, think about that. So there was, you know, I've, I've been cut from boats before and I understand that It's not personal, you know, sometimes just the personalities don't match necessarily, but there was a little bit of shock of this is the end of my collegiate career. You know, it's kind of a hard way to end it. I kind of had to grapple with that the whole day. And it helped that I was able to go visit my boyfriend in Connecticut. So I was a little bit further away from the training center. I didn't have to stay there that day. Right, right. But it was, it was weird. To think like, you know, I don't technically have to wake up at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Like, <laughs> I can like, I can be done with the sport right now if I choose to. Did that make it easier to know that you actually wanted to continue with the sport? Yes. I think I took those couple days without any rowing and was like, you know what? I'm not done with the sport yet. <laughs> like, there is some <laughs> unfinished business. I can't let it end like that. And yes, I'm willing to dedicate you know, the next few years. But the great thing about the men's team is they're very relaxed in terms of if you actually need to be in the Princeton Training Center over four years. Like, they don't mind if, you know, you take a few years to work and then come up and join the team. Like, I know a few of the guys are going to Cambridge or Oxford and they're training there. And then coming back in 2018, 2019 to start training, it's very different from the women's senior team where they expect you to be there for four years, full time, no job, no nothing. Like they want you to be fully committed. Hmm. The men's team doesn't expect that. That's um, interesting. Yeah, it's a very, it's very different, but I almost prefer it because as a coxswain, I think we mentioned, we talked about this, but we do a lot of sitting around, right. Um, right. especially on the senior team since they go out in small boats all of the time. So it's, it's almost better in a way for me to get a little bit of time to work. I'll probably train at the New York athletic club, maybe not every single day, but as much as I can with my job. And then whenever I feel ready, you know, in 2018, 2019, you know, then I'll call Mike Tady, who's probably going to be the coach through the Olympics and say, Hey, I'm ready to start training full time. Yeah. So it's, 
it's kind of a blessing in disguise uh, to have been cut from the team this summer. <laughs> yeah, you sort of get both of both the things that you wanted. Yeah, exactly, which I never expected at all. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I really appreciate it. I'm going to keep an eye on what you're doing still. I, I just love it. Yeah, no, you know, hopefully 2020. I'm really hoping. Thanks for listening. I know it's totally a pain, but please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. It really does help the podcast to reach more people and to get the word out about female athletes and women in sports. Just a reminder, Ali's Bar is still available for listeners at 50% off with free shipping using the promo code HERSPORTS. That means a box of 12 are only $14. And they taste great and aren't loaded with sugar. There's been a lot of chat about meal planning. I'm totally terrible at that and often find myself happily saved by an Alley's bar. Also, check out the new layout of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. It has a beautiful landing page featuring a design by Agnes Studio. It's easier to find the podcast you want and to listen directly from the site. Sign up for our newsletter and follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Hear Her Sports. See you in two weeks.